Uh, good evening, everybody. Said I've been visiting the Pyrenees for a long time. It's a fantastic area. If you've never been there or you have, you've not skied there, you may have been there in summer, which is equally valid. It's a beautiful place to visit in summer, but uh, in the winter it becomes something else. And what appeals to me about the Pyrenees is the feeling of remoteness that you can achieve very easily uh, in a region that is uh, as mountainous as a lot of the Alps. But the other unique selling point that we were just discussing was there's just not glaciers to worry about. So if you like taking some stuff out of your pack, then the Pyrenees is the place to go. Now, of course, you can put more back in if you end up going up to unmanned huts, of which there are many. Uh, but the hut network is slowly expanding and getting more comfortable. So we'll come to that in a little while. So I thought what I'd do is I'll take a an east-west traverse across the range uh, and pick out a few places that I've been to and that I'm sure many of you who are on the, uh, who are viewing will, will recognize maybe if you've been to the Pyrenees, um, but maybe there'll be some areas that you're not so familiar with. So here we go, let's just uh, kick off and see what happens. So, uh, so just to give you an idea of the main areas that we have in the Pyrenees, um, you can see this is this is taken from a book written by two gentlemen, um, Faura and Longas, which is a Spanish guide to a lot of the plums of the Pyrenees. But just looking at the overall pattern of the range, you can see if you not if you didn't know already, it's sandwiched between France and Spain, and with Catalonia at the eastern end and you sort of get into the fringes of the Basque country at the Western end. Uh, so there's a real interesting mix of cultures, languages, uh, cuisine, etc. as you work your way through. Uh, the language can be an issue. As you can see, we have our main languages that you'll recognize, but you may not recognize the top one. The top one is Catalan. Uh, Spanish and French, so you could find yourself with any of those, depending on where you are. Catalonia runs out about a quarter of the way to a third of the way in to the range coming from the east, um, but nevertheless, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic area, and that includes the whole of Andorra, of course. Uh, other lesser hazards? Well, you're unlikely to meet the Pyrenean mountain dog on the right, perhaps, but you do come across the tracks and the scents of bears. Uh, in fact, the last tour I was on only last year, just before lockdown began, we were in a wood that had obviously been well tracked by brown bears like these uh, and things like the Cabra Montes at the bottom, the, the, the Bucatan, as you might call it. Uh, very, very common. So just to give you a, a sort of overview of what the range looks like, uh, working from the east across to the west, we go first from one or two outlying peaks and areas which are very popular largely with the Spanish and the Catalans and the French um, through Andorra and then into some of the better well-known areas, the Pico de Stats, uh, which is the biggest peak in Catalonia, uh, the Encantados, uh, the, is the national park, um, then the main uh, high peaks of Aneto, Osets, Monte Perdido, Pinimal, uh, and then out to the west to the peaks of Navarra where things are starting to tail off again. So the far eastern ranges, now I have to confess, I've not actually been to any of these. Uh, I've visited them in the summer, I've hiked and walked around those areas, but the two, the two sort of main peaks that people like to climb are Canigou and Picalit which are well known as sort of singletons, if you like. I think it, if you look at the information surrounding these peaks, it's quite difficult to make um, multi-day trips around these because of the way they, they just poke up out of the, the plains around. But nevertheless, they'll give you plenty of entertainment. Uh, and in between those, there are a lot of other areas, a lot of other peaks which I've not um, covered here and I won't talk about, but perhaps, Kathy might be able to tell us a bit more about later in the area towards the middle of the picture here. You've got the Santuario di Nuria, which is a, um, a monastery, 
uh, reached by a very interesting rack railway, which comes up from the southeast. Uh, and this area in that region there around the frontier, up to the peak of Pujmal there, uh, provides reasonably good ski mountaineering. They're generally fairly straightforward mountains, but the big problem in this part of the range can be the wind. Uh, and they have a very famous wind called the Torb, which uh, can be extremely strong. So the first area that I'm a bit familiar with would be Andorra, where I've done some tours, and you may recognize one or two people there. We've got Jonathan Bamba, Andrew Duncan, Barney Crampton. Uh, and this is a tour that we did uh, about th four or five years ago. Um, and we went into Andorra. Uh, and Andorra is fantastic because not only can you link together uh, a mix of wardened huts, unwardened huts, but the uh, beauty of it is you get some great uh, day tours from the valley base. So if you like being staying somewhere comfortable in the valley and then climbing peaks, Andorra is a good place to go. Uh, as you might say, oh my goodness, but there's no snow on that picture on the right. Well, I think one of the things about the Pyrenees is that if you go at certain times of the year, you may find yourself hoofing your skis a bit. But generally speaking, most years, you won't be hoofing them too far before you're onto a, a nice snowpack. <clears throat> and it's usually pretty cold as well. Uh, so some, some day tours here on this uh, sort of 3D image of Andorra. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with Andorra, maybe some of the ski areas, this is the Grau Roig uh, ski area, Paz de la Casa. So this is just over the border from Paz de la Casa, which is off the picture here. Uh, and the main road that sort of runs right through Andorra will run down the valley here, past Soldeu, past El Tarder, down to uh, Encamp down here, and then further down and out through Andorra La Velia and so on. But the, the day tours, as you can see, are dotted about. Now, this is purely a selection. There are lots and lots of these. So if you want to go and do day tours, Andorra is as good a place as any. Uh, and you can find some very nice places to stay. And you take yourself off with a little hire car and uh, head off up into the mountains. So hopefully we'll be able to give you a flavor of some of those. So here we go. So, you know, as I said, comfortable. Uh, this is a bit, perhaps a little bit uh, misleading because this is a refuge called the Ilia Refuge, which is, uh, as you can see, pretty brand new. Uh, and it was built by the uh, owners of the ski area at Grauroj. And then they sort of used it as a bit of a, place where people could go for trips from the ski area and they could go out there, stay the night, do a little tour, come back again. Um, but it is open to the public. Uh, on this particular occasion, we'd arrived there after it had only been open about six months and they were completely taken aback to see us because they'd lost our booking. Um, and we had to sort of fight our way across this large dog, which was sat outside in the snow, enjoying the snow because it was too hot in the refuge. Uh, but we had a fantastic night there. So we had a group of five or six of us and uh, we used it as a sort of two day warm up, basically, where we traveled out from one of the ski areas to the Ilia, stayed the night there and then headed off and did a bit of a circuit around and back to where we'd started. Uh, and it's an interesting hut because um, I'm sure Kathy could confirm whether this is still the case, but they're very keen on making this a sustainable mountain refuge. So you have to take away all your bedding. And basically you get given a pack when you arrive, which is all disposable uh, paper, paper bedding. So you get uh, paper um, pillowcase, paper sheet sleeping bag, um, etc. Uh, and you just, and you're given a bag and you take it away with you when you've used it and they don't want to get rid of it for you. So they tell you to take it off. <clears throat> they run the stove off lots of pellets, so it's uh, you know it's sort of all recycled stuff like that. So it's and it's a it's a nice hut, very comfortable, very comfortable, definitely. Um, Andorra is blessed with quite a lot of snow, 
so it's often got enough snow to make uh, really good tours. Uh, it gets everything from early season powder through to some fantastic uh, spring snow. Uh, and in most years, you could probably be skiing in Andorra right through till end of April, May, uh, into May, uh, and so on. Obviously walking a bit further than you might in a more snowy year. <clears throat> so this is one of the peaks that we did, the Cabanetta. The Cabanetta, uh, as you see, just under 3,000 metres. Uh, anybody who's been there in the summer may have been up the Vaidinklas, which is a very beautiful valley that in the summer has a very regulated transport system. So you have to travel up there with a little bus uh, and you're not allowed to drive your car up, you park at the bottom end uh, and it takes you up the valley. Well, there was no bus that day, as you can see. And in fact, the next bus is in May. Uh, and so we had a we had a splendid day. Uh, we just had a snowfall. This would have been uh, late February, late February. So lots of new snow around, uh, and a tremendous, tremendous peak. I don't think we saw anybody that day. We might have seen one other person on this trip uh, up to the top of this peak. Uh, and then this is another fine peak as well, the Font Blanca. The Font Blanca is up towards um, uh, beyond Ordino, which is sort of up to the northwest corner of the area. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful big peak, very shapely, and it has this very fine uh, face on it. Uh, which faces, I think it faces west, but it's, um, it's steep, it's 40 degrees, uh, but it's a fine descent if it's in good condition, but you do have to be a bit careful to make sure that it is. Uh, and we were lucky, it was in fantastic condition. So we skied off the top and as you can see, it's a, it's a tremendous viewpoint at the top as well. Uh, and you can do this up and down from the road. Uh, and, and again, we didn't see anybody else that's taken from the top, uh, looking on to what are more attractive peaks, sort of just over the border. We're almost on the French frontier here. Uh, so you are, you know, you can, you can sniff the baguette, basically, when you stood there. Uh, another route that we did while we were out there, and another very popular one, and in fact, it's one that um, Cathy wrote up on a, a website that we can talk about later on, uh, is the Traverse of Two Cols. Now, one of the other huts that's open in Andorra in the winter is this one, the Refugi Sorteni, uh, which is run by um, a couple of very nice ladies who share it between them, <clears throat> uh, certainly in the winter, because there isn't the same amount of business. Uh, and they, they opened this up uh, we were there having booked this beforehand. While we were there, there were three very gnarly tanned uh, Spaniards who turned up who were doing the full traverse in the Pyrenean range and they looked black from all the sun, uh, weather beaten, but unfortunately they had no booking. And so she showed them to the winter room <laughs> underneath, which was a bit harsh, I felt. So we sat up there with this stove going while they went in what what was like a garage <laughs> underneath. Uh, and she was quite happy for that to be the case. And they said, yeah, that's fine. We've got our food, we've got big duvets, we'll be all right. Um, but this is a very nice circuit that you can do. Again, you can either go from the hut or you can do this from the road. Uh, and it uh, does a loop where it crosses over one col from Andorra into France, goes around the back, comes back over the second col and skis down past the hut here and uh, you either stop there or you uh, carry on back to your car. Uh, so as, it, as, it, as you can see, a very another comfortable hut. <coughs> uh, and from here, we also climbed this one, the Peak de l'Estagno. This is another nice peak, nearly 3000 meters. And again, with a steep face on it, sort of touching 40 degrees, uh, really good skiing, really good skiing. Can't recommend it too much and uh, again nobody else around uh, it's pretty quiet pretty quiet place now if you fancy just, just moving on from andorra if you want to continue uh, and going uh, hut to hut or refuse to refuge well andorra does have options for that it has a whole network of unwarden refuges 
Uh, many of these are in uh, very basic condition. Quite a few of them do have um, bed frames in with a sort of sprung base, but they're not, they're not comfort by any means. Um, you'd need to have things like uh, a sleeping mat with you and a sleeping bag. But they're, they're definitely there, and there is a documented uh, tour that goes right round all these refuges in Andorra. If you wish to, you could do that. There is a third refuge which they're looking at opened, opening called the Jukla, uh, and that may well be open in the coming years. I think uh, Cathy was saying they were experimenting with doing that this year, uh, but obviously this was a bit of a non-starter. So they'll probably move on to look at that again during next winter. <clears throat> so this is moving a bit further west now, and this was on a tour where we effectively started in Andorra, but crossed the frontier into Spain and went into the, an area called the Val Ferreira, uh, which then eventually leads you westward into Pico de Stats. And you can see some of the huts that are in that area are these kind of, um, well, they look like emergency shelters, but they're actually a bit more comfortable than that. They probably take about six. I usually get about six people in there. Uh, they're pretty snug and they're well looked after. Um, they have the sort of antechamber at the front there where they're stood. And then there's another inner door so that you can keep the snow out and so on. So this was working our way up from the Val Ferreira to the uh, to Pico de Stats. <clears throat> so we've gone just to the west as the picture, as the map shows there. You've gone out of Andorra and you're now into that sort of, where it says the Parc Natural del Pirineu. That's the Estats and the area of Tavascan. Tavascan is a small, rudimentary, I suppose is the best way to describe it, as a ski area. Um, they have a couple of lifts. I'm never quite sure whether they're going to survive from one year to the next. Sometimes they're open, sometimes they're not. Uh, they have some Nordic skiing around there, but it does have a reputation for a lot of snow in that area. Um, so just to show the picture in 3D, you can see that uh, Andorra is here. This is a sort of Andorra there, where my mouse is. And Coma Pedrosa is the highest peak in Andorra. And that sort of sits on the frontier, more or less. So we've moved west into the Val Ferreira. And the Val Ferreira is this one here. And then you've got the Massif du Montcalm up here, which includes the Peak des Stats. And Tavascan is just off to the west here. So we'll just I think these are ringed in there. I've got some just to illustrate where they are a bit better, really. So Tavascan is on that valley that runs sort of north south. Uh, Tavascan's a nice little village, beautiful little village, and it's got a nice hotel, a good spot for stopping, and, and a good spot if you want to sort of have a couple of days you can base yourself there and then drive further up the road and in fact the uh, the chap who owns it or who used to own it i don't know whether he still does but certainly a couple of years ago a gentleman called chavi he's very happy to uh, take you up in his uh, four wheel if you want to leave the car and just get driven to a start point or get picked up so uh, that's not a bad area if you want to go hunting the peaks uh, and this is Pico de Stats. Pico de Stats, highest peak in Catalonia, and it's a bit of a mecca. You can see the big cross there, lots of stuff draped around it. Uh, very fine summit, fantastic viewpoint. Uh, it's got some great routes on it. On the Spanish side, uh, they tend to be a bit easier, perhaps, than on the French side. The French, some of the French side can be quite steep. Uh, there is a peak just to the east of Estats called Solio, which also has some steep skiing on it. And there's a couple of long descents into the French valleys that are particularly gnarly, but you've got, you've got to get in the right condition, but they're, they're not the sort of thing you do a, a hut to hut tour on because they effectively take you down far too far and uh, into some remote valleys. So you probably end up just trekking out after you've done those. Um, the neighbouring peak of Montcalm is very easy to get at uh, and our tour that we did this time we, we took both of those in on our way around the area and we stayed at this amazingly odd refuge, the Refuge du Pinay. Uh, the Refuge du Pinay 
if anybody's been to the Refuge du Pinet, they will remember that it's run by some very eccentric blokes. Uh, it certainly was when we were there, who were, uh, they were great fans of so the sauce. So they spent uh, the afternoon we were there, we arrived and they presented us with some, some stuff for lunch. Uh, and they were already the best part of uh, three quarters of the way through a bottle of wine at that stage. Uh, and then they disappeared for the afternoon and went for sleep. Not unreasonable, but they were very odd. And they told some very odd stories. Uh, and they kept themselves in this little, in this little warm bit of their kitchen. Uh, whilst they left us, there, were, there was my party and another party there, and we were sat in the main hut. They didn't put any heating on whatsoever. And we had to spend the whole night sat in all our duvets while they were stuck in their kitchen in their t-shirts. <laughs> and then they told us this remarkably odd story about some, some dead dog that had crossed a path somewhere that we were going the next day. And they just kept telling us the same story over and over again. It's a very odd place. I mean, it may have changed now, of course. <laughs> they may have been retired. I'm not sure. Anyway, so we did head off back towards Tavascan, but you can see the downside that you might encounter occasionally with Pyrenean skiing on the right hand side. So these pictures were taken within about half an hour of each other, if that. Uh, and so we were blithely skiing down here and we'd, we'd gone over a route that was not tr very well tracked actually. And we thought it looked quite adventurous. So we crossed a call and then headed down the other side. And we were basically heading back to this hotel in the Tavascan Valley. Uh, and we thought this looks fantastic because this is a stream valley. Look at the snow on the other side. It's all going to be brilliant. We're just going to whiz down. And we uh, sort of went over the uh, hump that you can see in the foreground and we encountered the stuff on the right. So we ended up with a certain amount of portage um, and tree bashing and stuff like that. But you know, it all adds to the colour. Uh, and it's uh, very, it, it, it's, it's quite nice in some ways afterwards, after the event. But I know it was quite a late finish that night when we'd expected to be there very soon. Um, so I suppose in that sense, it's the psychological side of it more than the physical side of it that was the problem. Anyway. Uh, moving a bit further west from Tavascan, you can continue your traverse, if you wish, and go up to Montreuil. And there's another refuge up there called the Sertascan, uh, which again permits a couple of nice little tours. So you can go from the Tavascan Valley. You could take your time to go up to the refuge, do a peak. You could do a couple of peaks from there. You could traverse across to the Montreuil uh, bivouac hut and then head down. And what we did was we, uh, having been in the area before, we'd been in the Sertoscan Refuge and we'd skied in that region. Uh, so we decided that, and I'd been thwarted on climbing Mont Roig before. So that was our main objective. So we stayed at the Mont Roig bivouac hut, which you can see on the left there. Um, and again, it's very similar to the one that, we, that was in the earlier pictures, the orange one. Um, you can see Jonathan Bamba here and uh, Andrew Duncan. Um, and I think there was room for six of us here. And it was very cosy. We had a very nice time there. Uh, and then we climbed Mont Roig itself. And then we traversed across to another peak called Ventolau. Uh, and Ventolau is a very shapely peak. Now we were there uh, probably into April. So you can see that the snow is going in places here. Uh, not always the case, but it was on this occasion. Now, this looks dreadful. I know when you look at this picture, you think, that's the descent. Well, it looks terrible. But in actual fact, um, the route down goes uh, behind the uh, hump that's sort of ahead of Andrew. So he's just sort of pointing at the peak uh, that you can see there. And as I've said there, it looks a bit like Scotland, but it's actually a lot better. Uh, there was a lot of snow and my goodness, it was in fantastic condition because that's another unique selling point for the Pyrenees. You get brilliant spring snow and it does transform pretty quickly with it being that, that bit further south and the Alps a bit warmer than the Alps. So you can get heavy snowfall, uh, which transforms into good spring snow within 
couple of days uh, and it can be great to ski. So we had a top draw descent from Ventolao actually uh, down to the Tavascan area and then we're sort of just making our way back now down into the valley. Okay, so heading west, we come to one of the perhaps the better known uh, areas of Pyrenees, the Encantados. Some people, the Catalans would call it the Encantats. Uh, as you can see, it's the Parc Nacional de Gros Tortes, uh, Stani de San Morisi, and it's an area of really charming terrain. Uh, granite, little granite peaks. Well, they're not that little, I have to say, they're about 3,000 meters, but they're, they're granite peaks, little lakes, little basins, and you can move from sort of level to level. Uh, and it is a fantastic area, I have to say. It's a really glamorous uh, area for ski touring. Uh, very picturesque. Uh, and what also makes it attractive is that there's a big network of huts. Now, I've not marked up all the huts on here, but you can see that I've drawn some of the routes going out from the uh, Refugi Ventosa, which is one that is uh, awarded throughout the vast majority of the winter. Um, the, re the, the Refugia Stani Young, which is the, another one that is wardened. The uh, Maliafre that that arrow goes to is not wardened. That's usually um, unwardened. But the one up here, the Amidges, which is no more than about an, an hour, hour skin, perhaps hour and a half skin, uh, that one is wardened. Um, the Colomers, which is up here, is also wardened as is the Restanka, which is here. Um, and there's one down here, the Colomina, but I'm not, uh, is it there on the picture? It's somewhere down here, uh, which I can't quite pick out. Anyway, this, this was a, uh, there's a series of routes that I've marked on here, some of which I've done as day tours, and then obviously the Travis across between the refugees is very popular. And the reason why I marked up the parking and the taxi is because the Valley of Egos Tortas here, the San Nicolau, which is down here, is uh, prohibited for um, people to drive up, whether it's in the winter or the summer, it doesn't matter. But they have a taxi service, and this taxi service runs in the winter, and they just have a fleet of Land Rovers. Uh, so in the summer, they have hundreds of these Land Rovers that go up and down all day, ferrying people up there to go and stroll up to the lakes and so on. But the winter, you can effectively make an arrangement or ring them up and they'll come up and pick you up. Uh, and the hut wardens are very happy to uh, help you make the contact with them. So it, it makes doing circuits really feasible. Uh, and there's a big parking area down at the dam, at the Cavaliers uh, Dam, where that P is. Uh, so it's, it is a great area and you'll quite often find there's, there's a lot of people doing trips in that area. Uh, this was many, many years ago. So some of you may know the Snaddens, Dave and Moira Snadden. So this is Moira Snadden. So you can see how long ago it is because they've emigrated to Canada. It must be 15 or maybe 20 years ago. But this was uh, the first time we went to the Encantados and we had the most magnificent week where the sun hardly stopped shining. Uh, and we had sort of planned this fairly ambitious circuit around most of those refugees uh, and we achieved it and it was just amazing. So this was the first time that I'd been up um, Punta Alta. Now Punta Alta, if we just go back to that picture, you can see it's to the south of the Ventosa Refuge. So it's this peak here. Uh, it's a really nice ski peak uh, to go up. Very impressive, big mountain, quite direct. So you get some good ski descents in the right conditions. So that particular year we had started at the Restanka and we more or less followed the red line that's shown on this diagram where we traversed, uh, oh no, actually we came in from the west, sorry. We came in from the west and we came across one of the um, outlying uh, cols to the north of Beziberi, we dropped down to the Restanka. Then from the Restanka, we traversed over to the uh, Ventosa taking in a peak on the way. From the Ventosa, we did Punta Alta, and then we carried on where the blue line goes to the Estanid Yong. Then we did a traverse of this peak down here, Subinuish, 
and then up to the uh, past the Malia Frey and up to the Amidges. Uh, and then from the Amidges, we went across all the way to the Restanka. I think we did that in one day. And we'd done, we'd done a peak or two while we were here. We went up the Tuk de Ratera uh, and went back to the Amidges. And then we traversed across to the Restanka and then skied out to the north. Uh, and, it, and it's a really memorable area, that. It's a fantastic area. Uh, so this was us traversing uh, one of the peaks, Peak Contreich, uh, and uh, you can see the sun is shining beautifully. Now, the picture on the right, I'm going to show you a picture taken last year that is in more or less the same place. And <laughs> that's, that's why I took it, because it's not always sunny. So don't go thinking it is. Uh, so that's on our traverse across to the Estani Young again, and we're, we're here. Um, and we were there in March last year. So you might say, well, when you were locked down, or were you stuck in Spain or whatever? Well, we escaped Spain about five days before the lockdown. So we were well ahead of Dave, who was caught almost <laughs> uh, and nearly had to stay there for six months. So we were fortunate. We managed to do this tour and then uh, and then get out just before they locked the country down. So uh, we, so I was revisiting that area, uh, and it is it is a spectacular place, definitely. Uh, you can get poor weather any time of the year there, and you can also get thin snow cover if it's not a good year. So you can see on the left hand side there, we are now. That's the Calaires Dam, uh, or the Calaires. Um, that's the lake that's above the dam wall. The dam wall you can just make out at the end in the mist. And this was a year that was particularly lean. Uh, we were probably there maybe a bit late. We were probably there in April, uh, but it had been very warm and they'd had very poor snow that year. So we ended up doing a, a fair amount of walking. Um, last year, which was also not brilliant, I have to say in March, uh, there was more snow there than there is on that picture. So we were able to skin most of the way around the side of that lake last year and all the way up through these boulders. Uh, and, that, and that itself was a poor snow year. So you can see that's exceptionally bad. Um, Tim Watling, who I think is on watching this, will recognize himself stood at the door there thinking, must I go out in this? Well, yes, is the answer. So we had another go at Punta Alta in poor weather. Uh, and there we are, having summited. So yeah, it's like all ski tours, isn't it? You can have great days out in poor weather uh, if you know where you're going and if it's not too complex. Uh, and we were lucky because we got, we'd gone up to the hut. We'd had the poor conditions coming up. We'd had a wet, warm time. Uh, we got to the hut, it cooled down a bit, it was brilliant higher up the mountain and we had a great ski bike. So you've just got to go out and see, haven't you? So you get plenty of time, obviously, in bad weather for planning. That's the uh, Refugi Ventosi Cave, which uh, is wardened uh, throughout the winter uh, by quite a character. And they've now built an extension on that since these pictures were taken, uh, which has a drying room and it has space for them to live in uh, and stores and so on. So it's released more of the hut uh, and the hut itself is very comfortable, I have to say, well looked after. Uh, okay, so moving a bit further west, we're getting into the area of the big peaks now. Uh, and these will be the ones that perhaps people who've been to the Pyrenees will recognize more. So the central region with uh, Aneto, uh, Maladetta, Bozets. Uh, I've marked up where the Pico de Alba is because we're going to look at that in a minute. Um, and the you can see right on the right hand end of the picture there is where the Eguas Tortas, where we've just been, the Encantados. Uh, and here's, whoops, sorry, let's go back again. Uh, wait a minute, let's try again. Sorry about this. Here we go. Right, so. Uh, here's Beziberi, then you have this massive valley here running north-south, which divides the Encantados area from the Aneto, and it's also the sort of linguistic frontier 
if you like, because to the east of that valley is Catalonia, and to the west, as you can see written on this diagram, is Aragon. So suddenly, nobody wants to speak Catalan anymore, they all want to speak Spanish. Uh, Castellano, whereas to the east, they're all Catalans. Um, and these are, these are big mountains as well, and also granite. Uh, this is the Aneto and the Renclusa region. This is taken from uh, a guide by a, a Frenchman called Marc Breuil, uh, who wrote about a traverse of the Pyrenees from one end to the other. And he not only documents a route for a traverse, but he has sections within the guide, which I can show you later, uh, which give you ideas for day tours. So they give you places that you could go and base yourself or how you can do these various routes in and around um, areas where there's a concentration perhaps of refugees or good routes, good mountains. So this is the Aneto and the Renclusa region. Uh, and the, the big hut is the Renclusa, the Refugio de Renclusa up at the top there, which I think it takes about 140 people. Uh, now it does get quite busy, but it's not usually absolutely packed out, probably unless you go at Easter weekend. Um, but when I've been there, it's been pretty comfortable. Uh, and it does have these fantastic mountains nearby. So this was one trip we did where we actually climbed Aneto. Uh, it's the biggest peak in the Pyrenees, 3,404. And it is a dramatic area of these uh, big granite peaks. So you, you know, it reminded me of uh, some of the peaks in central Switzerland uh, in the way that they have these towers of granite uh, and it's a very interesting ascent. You head off up the remnants of one of the glaciers, uh, which is crevasse free, and you go through this thing called the Potillon Superior, which is just like a pass in the ridge. Uh, so it's that notch um, in the middle picture that you can see people descending from. Uh, and you sort of climb your way through there and then you head off again out across here. Now, having said that the, uh, Pyrenees is not an area where there are glaciers. They're not necessarily glaciers that you'd worry about, but this is the Glacier d'Aneto, um, which is north facing, and it does provide some fantastic skiing. Uh, we are just coming to the summit here, so we're ascending the glacier there uh, up towards the top, and then you have the uh, summit in the distance, and there's this very exposed Paso de Maumet which is just ahead of the summit. And it's a very narrow uh, rock traverse. It's a, it's a bit like uh, bits of striding edge, I suppose, but there are some jolly big drops on either side. It's quite exposed. So it's not technically very difficult, but it is very exposed. Um, but it takes you right up to the top and you can see the cross in the distance there. So we sort of went up there bit by bit, one by one, but you can see there's a few more people in these pictures now than there were. And then the uh, icing on the cake, if you like, is this ski down in the glacier, uh, which is a brilliant uh, ski in the right conditions. You know, so uh, if you get powder on it, it's fantastic. The drawback is that you then have a reascent to the Renclusa refuge, unless you're going back to your car. So if you're staying at the Renclusa, you've got something like, I think it's 250 meters to go back up but it's not such a hardship after such a good day, to be honest. Uh, in that area and from that hut, you can access lots of others. So uh, there are plenty of other peaks that you could go at. One of them is Pico de la Maladeta. Um, and we did this on a day that started off looking lovely and then became pretty miserable up at the top. I think we were just sat in a load of cloud on the summit, but... Um, they're quite steep in places. So you can skin with this particular peak. What you do is you skin up the uh, uh, even smaller remnants of a glacier to the foot of a couloir, which you then boot pack up to the summit ridge. Uh, and then you just turn left and head up to the top. It's not, it's not very steep. If there's plenty of snow, it's very straightforward. Um, but you can't, well, I suppose somebody might get to the top on the skis, but I couldn't. And, uh, None of us did. None of us did. Uh, so it's a nice little mixture of things there. And then you get this nice ski back down from there back to the refuge. 
Uh, and an even more spectacular one is the Pico de Alba. And the Pico de Alba is a beautifully shaped peak with a fantastic snow face on it. Uh, it is very steep at the top, so you've got some steep skinning, uh, but you've also then got about a couple of hundred feet of climbing up uh, a snow field that turns into a bit of a thin gully near the top uh, and pop out onto the summit. The beauty of the Pico de Alba is that you can ski straight down from there, right back to the car, more or less, and you get the most fantastic thousand meters of uh, descent all the way back down to the Benasque, the Ho Hospital de Benasque Valley. Okay, so going a little bit further west again, so we're now crossing over uh, so we have the town of Benasque, which is like the sort of uh, Pyrenean Fort William, <coughs> if you like. It's got, it gets a lot more sunshine than Fort William. It doesn't get as much rain. Um, and uh, it's definitely a sort of outdoor adventurer's mecca. But you go west from there, you then end up in the Posets uh, and, the Pico, uh, and the Estos Valley area. So there's another big area of peaks around here. So this tour that we did was from the Angel Orus Refuge, which I remember at the time felt pretty basic, but it's big uh, and it gets you close to this peak. But Posets itself is a very nice mountain uh, and you can skin all the way to the top. It looks, it looks unlikely, um, but the route is pretty good. And indeed, if you're intrepid, you can traverse Posets and you can ski down to the north uh, from there uh, down to uh, another refuge on the other side. It looks pretty gnarly when you look at some of these pictures. And I know I remember when we were going up, we kept thinking, well, where is it going to go? When is it going to go? But it just sort of opens up as you climb up uh, and it gradually unfolds. And before you know it, you find yourself uh, on the top. And uh, I think we had just a very short climb here to get to the summit. Um, you can see in the bottom right down here, this is a ridge, a continuation ridge. Now the Travis needs you to head off across that for a bit before you get to a point where you can ski down. So it is a bit, it is a bit exciting. I think you'd want the right conditions, good visibility. Um, but it's a, it's a good peak. It's a really nice peak uh, and it's a big peak. And then just a, a bit, bit to the north, actually, from here is the Estos Valley. And the Estos Valley is just over the frontier from France. So, you know, you can see saint larry Soulon to the north there. And um, I've forgotten the name of the... There are some, some well-known towns further to the north, spa towns. Uh, and you're just over the frontier from them, basically. Uh, and we headed off from Benasque into the Estos Valley and the Estos Refuge. Um, that thing in the middle that says Estos is not the refuge, it's just a signpost. So uh, we headed on up there um, and it was quite interesting because just before you get to the Estos Refuge, you sort of skin your way across various humps and bumps and you head down um, a slight descent. And somewhere during this slight descent, we had uh, one of the party had uh, put their skins in the top of their rucksack with the lid down. <laughs> and when they reached the hut, they'd only got one skin. Oh dear, not good. So uh, when we went off the next day to climb a peak in the sunshine, this chap went back to retreat, see if he could find his skin, because he knew where he'd last had it and he knew where the, the hut was. And he found it hung on the branch of a tree. Uh, and what had happened was, as he'd been descending under these trees, the branch had very neatly hooked the skin and uh, pulled it out of his sack without him realising. Uh, and he did have, and I'm, unfortunately I've not got the picture, but he, he did have a picture of this tree with this skin just hanging beautifully, draped on it, looking a bit like a Christmas decoration. So he managed to retrieve it, so he was very happy about that. Uh, in the meantime, we climbed this peak, which is uh, Peak de Clarabide, 
And Clarabide is right on the French frontier. Uh, and it was a beautiful day, as you can see. Uh, Clarabide has a very steep section just near the bottom uh, where the snow fills in over a, um, a waterfall. So if it gets thin, it can be icy and it can be quite dangerous later on in the day. So you need to be out, out and off pretty quick. So we were skinning up on some quite hard snow here, but we did get a very fine descent and we did make it before we got uh, wet through at the bottom. So it is a great peak and you know, you're looking back on things like Posets. So there's Posets, as you can see, it's a very fine peak uh, with a number of different routes on it. Uh, and then moving further west again, we come to the area that's sort of around Gavani. So Gavani is well known for its ice climbing and the big wall at the Cirque de Gavani, uh, but also uh, the Odessa Valley, which is just on the south side of that area. And you get into some very uh, interesting and big peaks, Monte Perdido, uh, Balaitus, Vignamal, uh, they're all in this area. Uh, and so we start with the famous Breche de Roland. So the Breche de Roland looks like a massive slice through the ridge. Uh, and the, the, you know, the historical story is that this is where Roland, who, who crops up in lots of stories about uh, Spain and France, made his escape and had a battle and uh, you know, chopped, chopped a passage through the ridge in order to allow passage for him and his soldiers. Um, but it's very fine and it is the frontier and it's the frontier between uh, the French side, which is here. So here we are uh, skinning up on the French side. This uh, I think is uh, Taillon, the peak of Taillon in the background. Uh, sorry, on the, on the right of that picture. Uh, and once you get through the Breche de Roland, of course you're in Spain. So you go from one to the other. Quite often you go from cloud on the French side to sunshine on the Spanish side. You want another unique selling point for ski touring in Spain. So Monte Perdido close up. Well, Monte Perdido is very interesting because now instead of being uh, in a big area of granite peaks, you've moved into an area where there's an awful lot of limestone. Um, and Monte Perdido is actually a limestone peak uh, and it's uh, all very contorted. It's a most spectacular area for geology. You know, if you stand in that region and you look at all this folding, it is just awe-inspiring, really. And each one of those summits that you can see in the distance there are possible as ski peaks. They're not, uh, they're not always that difficult either. Some of them require a bit more climbing than others, uh, perhaps short rock bands. Some of them you can skin almost right to the top um, because it depends on which side you come at them. And generally speaking, if you come at them from the Spanish side, it's a much more gentle uh, approach. And the main Spanish refuge for that area is the Gorith, which is wardened all year, 365 days. Um, and this sits just above the Odessa Valley, which you can see uh, looks a bit ominous on the left there, but you can see the canyon of the Odessa. Uh, and then behind it, so if this chap who's at the door was to turn round, then this is what he'd see behind him. Uh, so it's, uh, it is in a spectacular spot. Uh, and it wasn't particularly good weather when we were there, as you can see, uh, we had mixed conditions, um, but you do get quite a lot of snow. And it's also can be quite dangerous in some places, um, particularly if you're going to climb Monte Perdido. Uh, you can see the Odessa Canyon in the distance there, very spectacular layers of rock. Uh, but we went to see if we could climb Monte Perdido. Um, I've been up there in the summer, uh, so we thought, well, let's go in the winter. Let's do this in the winter. But it is notorious up this final snow slope where the arrow's pointing. You can see it's called the Escupidera. And it doesn't look anything to worry about too much here, but when you're there, uh, you look over the edge, there is a huge drop. Uh, and if anything went wrong when you're on there or you get avalanched off there, you'd be taken down a long, long way. 
So you do need to be very careful with the conditions in that area. And on this particular day, you can see the track stop, which is about where we reached and we felt it wasn't really safe to continue. It, it does get a lot of avalanches uh, in the wrong conditions because of the steepness and the nature of the snow there. So uh, it's something just to watch. So instead, what we did was we came back to a call on the uh, which runs onto the north side of Perdido, and there is the vestiges of a glacier on the north side of Monte Perdido, but there is a very fine ski down. So after a, a short boot down through all this rubble, uh, you get onto some fantastic snow, and you can ski right down into the valley uh, there. And what our aim was was to then traverse to a refuge which is there in that notch. And that refuge is a refuge called the Tukaroya, uh, which again is another bivy hut, uh, but it is in a fantastic position, just at the top of a gully. Uh, and we could then head off back into France from there. Now, it was beautiful weather when we took this picture and we thought, ah, oh, this is fine because we'll just scoot across this valley at the bottom and then we can see where we're going. Unfortunately, by the time we got there, all this mist that you can see coming into picture uh, had sort of, oh, there's a better picture of the refuge. So there's the refuge stuck in that notch up at the top. Um, you have to sort of find the right notch because in poor visibility, you can see that uh, nobody had been up there. So it was quite awkward to pick out the right spot to start heading up. Uh, and when we appeared there at the base of the valley, not the actual hut itself at that time, fortunately, but the base of the valley was filled in with fog. So it, it took us a little bit of a, you know, there was a sort of bit of soul searching, a bit of navigation to decide, are we, are we in the right spot here? So we'd, we'd sort of taken a line on this and thought we were fairly confident and actually we were, we were correct, we were, we were fortunate. Uh, but we headed up this uh, last bit of boot pack to the refuge and then we were the only people there. So it is uh, a very interesting refuge. It's got a stove, uh, there's plenty of wood there, um, but it's not always uh, snow free. So it depends who shut the door last. And I think one of the, one of the backs of the rooms, uh, there's two rooms and the back of one of them was, had quite a lot of snow in it, which we sort of cleared up a bit. But you know, if you like this sort of backwoodsman feel and a bit of remoteness, then it's an amazing place to go to, but it was a bit of an awkward exit because it went all warm and horrible. Uh, unfortunately, we managed to escape to Gavani um, in some poor weather, as you can see. So we're smiling because we've made it, but it was a bit wet and miserable. Um, uh, so the last sort of big area that we've got is the area which has Vinyamal uh, and Balaitus. Now, Vinyamal and Balaitus are two of the biggest peaks, again, in that sort of central region. Uh, got some fine, fine uh, routes on them. Most people have heard of Vignemal and the glacier approach from the Ulet Refuge. The Ulet Refuge is this one down here on the east side. Uh, you can, you can travel, you can, well, you take the normal route comes up by this refuge, we're just off picture, which is the Besselance. That's not usually wardened. I think it can be sometimes, but it's not always. And then uh, up the glacier Dosu to the west. And that's the route that most people would take to reach the summit of Vinyamal. Um, we traversed in from the, uh, the Wallon, I think. I seem to remember we came from the Wallon and we crossed over a couple of ridges and we dropped down through the behind the uh, Peak d'Arati and the Col des Oulettes to the Refuge des Oulettes, and then we climbed in Yamal from there. Now, there is a new hut on here, or it's, it's not new now, but it's relatively new, the Bachimanya, which is shown there. And there are plenty of routes that you can do from this place here, Banyos de Panticosa. Uh, and there is a refuge down in the Banyos de Panticosa, but it has a reputation of not being very friendly. Um, so the building of the Bachimanya refuge has made that area a much more uh, friendly place for doing circuit, circular tours or doing peaks, a bit like the Encantados, 
because you've now got the Bachimania, you've got the Wallon, uh, you've got the Oulette, you've got the Bessilance, uh, and although, and you've got the Panticosa if you wish to, but although you've got this one marked here, the Respomuso, the Respomuso sadly is closed during the winter. Uh, and it was, it was built many years ago. Uh, well, I say many years ago, probably about 10, 10 15 years ago. Uh, as a very smart new refuge. Unfortunately, I don't know how this happened, but they built it in an area that was subject to avalanches from Balaitus. Uh, and it was open the first winter when there was the most enormous avalanche which came down off Balaitus and completely engulfed this refuge. Uh, and two blokes were in the winter room and they had to dig their way out and uh, they must have been very frightened at that time when that happened. Uh, but ever since then, there's been a sort of mix of building avalanche barriers, opening it, not opening it. And I think the latest situation is that they just close it in the winter now, which is a great shame because it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a nice smart refuge, uh, but unfortunately it's not available. So if you go to climb Balaitus, you probably have to, either have a long day or you attack it from the French side because there are a couple of huts over that side. And in fact, when we did it, uh, so there's Vignemal and there's Balaitus. Uh, and when we did it, we climbed it via the French side. We came over past the Respomuso, went into France over a col, and we stayed at a refuge whose name I forget. Was it, it might've been the Laribet. And then we went up the Neus Glacier uh, to the top. And at the Neus Glacier, uh, it, it describes in the guidebook, it says, well, all you do is you go up the Neus Glacier and then you just climb this bit of a snow gully and you're on the top. Well, when we got there, all we could find was the remnants of a snow gully, which looked pretty serious. And we made, a, we made an attempt at it, but it just looked, it was far too difficult in the conditions for what we had with us. It was almost doing a, you know, doing a grade three ice climb. Um, and uh, we scouted around for something easier, but we couldn't find anything. We were definitely in roughly the right place. And as you can see, it's beautiful visibility. So there was no question about not being able to see anything. Uh, so reluctantly, we gave up and I've not been to the top. I'll have to go back. Um, but the descent down the Neus Glacier made going up there worthwhile because it is a brilliant long descent and uh, it was in good condition. So we had a, a very fine ski as compensation. So that's always a good thing. Uh, if you take on the Glacier de Vignemal, it's a sort of typical uh, plod up a very easy angle glacier and you just work your way up until you're up near the top. Uh, you can see that. Uh, um, a final a final climb up gets you to the summit. So here's the two contrasting sides. That's uh, on the left is the north side, taken from part way up from the Oulette Refuge, which has a lot of uh, very well-known uh, routes on it, rock routes and uh, winter gullies. But then on the other side, it's much more benign. Uh, and in fact, the picture on the right is the back of the peak this snow slope here is the back of this peak that's just got the cloud on. Uh, and the main summit is just a bit behind that, a bit further on. Uh, and that's what it looks like from the west. So this was taken during the traverse as we were coming around on the coals, through the coals from the Wallon refuge. So, you know, it gives you an idea of what you're in for. It's, uh, it is approachable from different sides, but as you can see, some of them are quite serious. Uh, so, the final area to the west is now taking us into the fringes of the Basque country. So this is Navarra, uh, and there is a route that's marked on in green there, uh, which I've not done. And I've not done it because it was going to be last year, and that was when we ended up rerouting to the Encantados because there was just no snow, none whatsoever in this area. We would have walked most of that route, which was a great shame because it looks pretty fantastic. And there's lots of big limestone 
mountains in that area uh, and some very interesting sections. Uh, it, it takes a bit of piecing together, but you know, it's a project, if you like, for the future. So that sort of brings us to the western end and the mountains start to run out at that point. Um, and if you're traversing, I see David is on this. David will have remembered that I think from more or less from there, you end up walking. I mean, in fact, you walk most of the way, <laughs> I think. But you, you go down to the, uh, the chalets at Ori uh, and the, the mountains start to tail off at that point. Uh, and so there's not much beyond there that is skiable. So I thought I'd just take a few references in if, you know, if you're interested to uh, pick up these things, um, then the main uh, sources for your weather are the three that I've listed there. Depends which country you're in, obviously, Meteo France, which sure most people will be familiar with, and they have a fantastic coverage with their Montagne section. Uh, IMED, which is the um, Spanish, weather they also do a very good section on um, not only the mountain weather but the snow conditions uh, it's very detailed uh, and then meteor.ad which is andorra and that also has a lot of very useful information on uh, avalanche conditions as well in the area uh, the bulletins for the avalanche i mean i can i can easily uh, this will be on the um, youtube channel anyway so if people want to catch these they can go uh, and uh, pinch it from there. Um, but there are a number of um, avalanche bulletins from the different countries and the different areas. Uh, Valdaran has its own. The Valdaran is the area to the north of the Encantats, uh, and it has an extraordinary language, uh, which is Aranais, and that you can see elements of it in that very last uh, web address. Uh, but it is good, uh, and it, it looks very similar to the um, one that the uh, Catalonia produce, which is the one that's shown in the picture on the right there. Uh, and they use the, the, the classic international approach to describing avalanche conditions and so on. Um, and you can also get uh, slope angle maps from the IGC, which is the Catalan uh, area. So I, I don't think they've started, they've done those for the rest of the range, but certainly in Catalonia, you can do it. Um, and then maybe just a few guides. There's plenty on the web these days. There's plenty on the web. Um, there is an, it depends how good your languages are. If you're, if you're just looking for English references, then there's, there's still quite a lot, but there's even more. If you're comfortable with Spanish or French, uh, you'll find that most of the guidebooks are Spanish, Catalan, French. Um, I've yet to come across one that's written in English. Uh, but there's plenty of other references that you can look up. And there's a fantastic uh, one that maybe um, Kathy could say something about in a minute, which is called Wikiloc. And Wikiloc is a, uh, a site that allows you to hunt out all sorts of um, routes that people have used or done. Sometimes they post photographs with them. They usually give a map description. And if you're prepared to burrow deep into it, you can get all sorts of information out of that. So, you know, the, the internet is definitely a very good source these days, which makes a, is in stark contrast to when I started going to the Pyrenees when it was really difficult to find information on that. So it's definitely getting better. If you want to buy some guidebooks uh, and you're happy to have them in a foreign language, I would recommend the Libreria des Nivelles which is the sort of bookshop associated with the magazine Des Nivelles, which is the Spanish uh, mountain magazine. Uh, it's a, uh, as, a, as a side issue, it's a fantastic magazine, I have to say. It's a really high quality. Um, and they have a uh, bookshop where most of those guys that you've just seen will be available, as well as many others. Uh, and I've always found that uh, the map shop at Upton on Seven is very good for getting hold of uh, maps of the Pyrenees, Catalonia, uh, whatever's available, they tend to know about them. Um, so that's it. Que vayas bien. So a question from Alex, who notes you talk mostly about the Spanish side. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? Uh, well, yeah, largely because um, I speak Spanish. 
and um, I've spent a lot of time in Spain and I just have an affinity for it and the culture's great and I get on very well with the people. Uh, it doesn't mean to say I object to going to the, to the French side. I've been on the French side a lot, but I probably have approached the Pyrenees more from the French and uh, from the Spanish and Catalan side. So that's all really. And um, well, you do you have an itinerary or are you working your way through the Pyrenees? Is there something specific that comes next? Uh, I'm not sure, you know. I, I mean, I, I do quite fancy that Navarra Hope route. It looks really good. But I think the problem is the you just got to get the snow. You just got to get the snow. And I suspect it's one of those things that you have to be opportunist about, really. It's possibly not one that lends itself to a long distance plan uh, in time. You know, that you, you sort of say, well, in April, I'm going to go and do that whole route. You, you may well be very disappointed. You probably have to move flexibly uh, so that it'll allow you to go somewhere else if there isn't enough snow there. I, I, I think they generally get reasonable snow there. It mm -hmm. was just, we were very unlucky. It was a lean year last year. Uh, and you probably know yourself, which is why we switched to the Encantados and then found that that was, that was quite lean. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did, I did wonder about doing um, the, the ski traverse in the central bit. I, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I thought the flog of going from sea to sea, I, I just wasn't quite as keen as David was to do that. And I think David's done a brilliant job. I mean, I admire that traverse was just brilliant. And uh, I watched, I, um, so David, I enjoyed your progress. I monitored your progress. Uh, as you were going and I knew I knew where you were and I knew what you were going through in a lot of those areas um, but I've often thought about maybe taking that central section you know and going from where uh, you start to get the, the more continuous mountainous areas um, so sort of Andorra basically when you start in on Hospitalet somewhere like that and then maybe headed west until you get to the Chalice Dori. Great. Uh, any other questions from anyone? And if anyone is interested in this area, we have several Pyrenees experts uh, in the uh, in the club. Dave Wynne Jones has done and led a lot of tours in there. Uh, David Hamilton has done the Pyrenees end to end on skis, which is quite the achievement. Uh, so, and I live in Andorra. So, if you're interested in that region, there are a number of people in the club you could reach out out to. Um, a question about wardened huts. Is there a list of numbers to call to book? Yeah, um, I think if you're on the French side, then the CAF ones are pretty well documented. Um, if you're on the Spanish side, it tends to be with the, the Federaciones, which is the clubs. So it depends who owns the hut. Um, so you tend to have to go onto the websites of the, of the club that own the hut. Uh, so if you look at the map and you find the hut, you'll probably find if you Google that, it will say it's the Federación de Aragón or, or whatever. And then you can go into those and get the, uh, the information on the huts. Um, things like the Encantados tend to be pretty good at putting the names out there. They have circuits that they publicize in the summer. They have a, a route called, which is basically Chariots of Fire. It's Carros de Foc in Catalan, but it's uh, it's effectively a marketing exercise to get people to use the huts and to come into the region. But they have uh, got together and made sure that people know where they are and how to get hold of them. And they have central booking and things like that. Yes, more and more of the huts are banding together and running a central booking site. Uh, it tends to be done by province in Spain. So you may end up, you need to look at Catalonia or Aragon, kind of just get your head around where, where the borders are. Um, but they, they're slowly getting better. And a lot of them have Facebook pages as well, which is, can be another way to reach them. Um, and, and just to pick up on the, uh, the point you made, uh, wikilock.com is a, a GPS track site, but the founders are Catalan. And the result, although it's a worldwide website at this point, it is heavily used, particularly by the Spanish and the Catalans. Yeah. 
so camptocamp.org is you know the French GPS site, and they've got quite a lot for the Pyrenees. Yeah. But I think Wikidoc is probably the the treasure trove if you yeah, look at your is, ideas. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Could I just uh, speak up for the people at uh, uh, the Casa Piedra at Banos Panticosa? Because I've been there a couple of times in recent years, and they're certainly not unfriendly now. Good. Although, part, part of it may, may be that I was with Spanish friends at the time, so yeah. maybe that made a difference, I don't know. I think it, it'll, be, it'll be one of those places where some people get a bad impression, others get a very good impression, you know. It's, it is really useful for getting up onto Garmo Negro, and yeah. it's a big climb, but uh, and those peaks on that side. Yeah. But it's it's actually more helpful than uh, Bachamana. Bachamana, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is great for the Spanish for the Spanish French border, of yeah. course. Yeah. 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 But worth a visit, yes. Yeah, worth a visit. All right, I'll put it on my list. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Peter, Dave, are either of you going to be leading Pyrenees tours um, for the next season? I mean, assuming we can. Well, Dave, it, Dave. It, yes, I'll be yeah, there. Yeah, Dave definitely is. Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've got one. I've, well, I've got one that I haven't done for three years because of the wretched pandemic. So I've got one in uh, Norway next year. But I'm thinking, I'm wondering whether to do one that's a valley-based one in the Pyrenees. So I may add that. If anyone's interested in the range um, and doesn't want to do all this work of working it out yourself, there should be a couple of tours on the on the program for 21-22 when it comes up.